As a sort of preemptive note, in the section that we are about to begin, we will focus on understanding how, in the passive phase, the membrane potential changes in response to a current injection. To do so, we will use our circuit model to arrive at equations that describe the behavior of the membrane potential as a function of both time and space. Along the way, we will discuss three important passive membrane properties. To generally describe them, passive membrane properties are intrinsic properties of the neuron that influence how the membrane potential of the neuron will change in response to a current injection as a function of time and distance. We have already seen two of the three properties. The first property is the membrane capacitance. The second is the membrane resistance or conductance, depending on how you see it. And the third property is the axial resistance. For the moment, I know that they do not mean much beyond what we have discussed, but as we go through the equations, these properties will become much clearer. Alright, so to understand these properties, let's begin small by greatly simplifying the circuit we have made. For the moment, let's not even think about the ion channels and only consider the capacitance of the cell. Also, let's assume that the capacitor is discharged. That is to say, it does not store any energy. If we inject positive charges in the system, the positive charges will create an imbalance of charges on the capacitor. Because of charge repulsion, the addition of a positive charge on one side will effectively kick out another positive charge on the other side. Due to the created movement on the opposite side, this creates a capacitive current. We will denote the injected current as capital I I and the capacitive current as capital I C. Furthermore, the charge imbalance, which we can note as delta Q, creates an electric field across the membrane which produces a potential difference of delta V. Delta Q and delta V can be linked together through the membrane capacitance in the equation delta Q equals Cm times delta V. Remember that this is just another way of writing the equation I first showed you when I introduced the membrane as a capacitor. The goal for us now is to see if we can find an equation that will model the change in membrane potential as a function of time. This will allow us to see how the membrane potential evolves over time with a current injection. First, we can establish the definition of the current, which is the net movement of charge per unit time. In calculus terms, this corresponds to the derivative of charge with respect to time. Secondly, we know from Kirchhoff's current law that the sum of all currents at a node is zero. Because of our conventions, the injected current will be negative since there are positive charges going inside the cell. As such, the capacitive current is equal to the injected current. We can replace the capacitive current by its definition dq over dt. Then, we can replace dq by its definition. We know that in our case, dvm is the membrane potential and since the membrane capacitance is a constant, we can take it out of the derivative. Now, we are left with a differential equation that we can easily solve, yielding this equation. To make things simple, we will assume that the current injected is held constant, and thus, the change in charge is simply described by the constant current we inject times the amount of time we have injected it for. To get a better feeling of the equation we just derived, let's see it graphically on the plot. You will notice that the equation we have is linear, so we can expect a linear behavior from our graph. Alright, on the first plot, let's show how the injected current evolves over time, and on the second plot, let's show how the membrane potential evolves over time. At first, let's assume that there is no injected current, and that the membrane potential is simply given by whatever resting value it already has. Then, at some initial time t1, we inject current up to a value i0. As we can see in the equation, the current injection will impact the membrane potential in a linear way up to a point where we turn off the injected current at some point t2. Because we are considering a scenario with no ion channels, the charges that have entered the cell cannot leave, so the membrane potential will maintain its value as long as there is no other current injection. But, we know however that the cell is not simply made of a plasma membrane, 
and that it also has a lot of channels on its surface, which essentially makes the membrane a leaky capacitor. Hence, we can add the leak channels as resistors to our model. Usually, we use the conductance value, but for reasons that you will see later, I will use the resistance right now. In this scenario, RL corresponds to the leak resistance, or in other words, the total resistance of the cell coming from all of the leak channels in the membrane. We will also assume that the current going through this resistor is positive and goes out of the membrane. We can make this assumption because we know that at rest, most of the current is coming from potassium, which has a tendency to leave the cell. The current from this resistor is IL. Interestingly, you can note that now our model of the neuron is essentially an RC circuit. As we did for the simple case with no resistor, let's find an equation that will show us how the membrane potential changes over time. Here again, we can start from the two basic equations we've established previously. Likewise, in this parallel RC circuit, we can establish that the sum of the currents in the node is equal to zero. Thus, with our convention, we can formulate that the injected current is equal to the capacitive current plus the current coming from the resistor. As we previously did, we can substitute the currents with more thorough definitions. For the resistive current, we can use Ohm's law. From there, we can multiply both sides by RL to get this expression. In this differential equation, we can find the steady state solution which occurs when the rate of change in membrane potential equals zero. With dV over dt being zero, it leaves us with Vm being equal to the injected current times the resistance of the membrane. Here, we can establish a new quantity called Vmax, also known as V infinity, which corresponds to the maximal voltage the cell can get at a steady state. With this new definition of Vmax, we can replace the expression on the left by the definition. Next, we can establish a new quantity named the time constant, which is represented by the Greek letter tau. This constant is essentially the product of the membrane resistance and the membrane capacitance and has units of time. We will see shortly how this constant applies to our system. Anyhow, let's substitute the constant in the expression and now we have a differential equation that we can solve. You can go through the steps on your own, but essentially we arrive at this expression. Here again, to understand how this equation operates, let's plot its evolution over time along with the injected current. You can notice that the equation we have is exponential and not linear anymore. This equation is a bit messy to read, but one way you can think about it is dividing it in three sections. In blue, we have the membrane potential of the system as a function of time. And in green, we have the maximal voltage that the membrane potential can attain. The tricky part is the exponential bit in pink. You can think of the pink segment as a factor that tells you how much the membrane potential in blue approaches Vmax. Indeed, the pink factor on its own is an increasing function that gives a value between 0 and 1. Thus, as T increases, so does the fraction of Vmax. To make it more intuitive, Let's see how this applies with an injection of current in our system. Here again, we'll assume that the injection of current is constant over a short interval T1 and T2. On the plot of Vm, we can indicate in dashed lines what would Vmax look like as a function of time. As we've established, Vmax is equal to the injected current times the leak resistance. Since the injected current and the leak resistance are both a constant, then so is Vmax. Therefore, as a function of time, Vmax will stay a constant and will have the same shape as the current. Now, for the actual membrane potential, at time t1, we can consider it as t equals 0 with respect to the current injection. By plugging 0 in the membrane potential equation, the pink term becomes 0 and so does the membrane potential. Now, as time goes by, the pink term progressively increases and the larger and larger portion of Vmax is attained up until Vm pretty much equals Vmax at T2. As Vm ascends to Vmax, remember that the time constant has units of seconds, and at some point the time will be equal to the time constant. When that happens, the value produced by the pink term is around 0.63. In other words, 
at the value of t equals tau, we say that the membrane potential is 63% of the maximal voltage. When the current is turned off at T2, the membrane potential progressively returns to the baseline state according to a similar equation. The equation is a bit different because it describes an exponential decay instead of an exponential growth, but it still has the same essential components. Now, to understand more in depth, why the voltage exponentially grows and exponentially decays, let's consider how the currents from the capacitor and the resistor operate in our model. When the current is injected in the cell, it first goes to the capacitor to charge it because the capacitor imposes the least amount of resistance to the current. But as it gets charged, the current going to the capacitor progressively diminishes because the capacitor is getting full and thus the current feels more resistance. Simultaneously, the current going through the resistor progressively increases since it now becomes the path with least resistance. When the current is turned off, the capacitor discharges a current that is compensated by the resistor. Since the voltage is mainly set by the current of the resistor, the shape of the voltage as a function of time will be the same as how the resistive current evolves for both the growth and decay parts. With this in mind, we can also analyze the system through the lens of the time constant. What happens when it is high or low and so on. First, let's establish a reference value in blue. Consider now a lower time constant because either the resistance or the capacitance is lower. In the increasing portion of the membrane potential, a lower value of tau means that as time goes by, a smaller fraction of time will be divided and thus the pink term will increase faster relative to the reference tau. As a result, the membrane potential will arrive faster at Vmax and discharge faster as well. With a higher tau, the opposite relation is true, which is that the potential will take longer to charge but also longer to discharge. Hence, you can see that by using a value of the time constant, we can compare neurons to see how the signals are maintained in them. You probably remember that there is another component to the channels, which is the driving force coming from the electrochemical gradient that is associated with each ion. When we include the driving force and do the math following the same principles as in previous scenarios, you can see that the model ends up being the same. The difference simply lies in the expression of Vmax, which now is offset by the Nernst potential of the leak channel. Hence, even with the battery added, it is still the same relation. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.